Welcome back into the Homegrown Happy Hour, everybody. My special guest tonight via the internet, Harry Clark of the Wooks. Harry, Howdy. what's up, buddy? Man, I'm just taking it easy in my in my bedroom. I'm uh, propped up against the, the wall here on a pillow on my bed, just chilling. Got my shoes off. Isn't it crazy that like we, we can do this? You know, it used to be you had to either like come in the studio or you had to do it over the phone. But now here you are with just, you're using your cell phone, right? Yeah, man. Just a cell phone sitting on your bed and we're doing an interview. Yeah, I can see your face. Yeah. I know what you look like. Like this camera right here is shooting something through wires up to a satellite down into Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm here in a little Herald, Kentucky, and mm -hmm. we can see each other, talk to each other in real time. And we're not even in the same time zone. How does that work? Yeah, dude, I really don't understand it. I just know that I knew, I kind of knew what buttons to press to get me here. It's, it's so leagues above my head, man. Yeah. I, I was uh, talking with somebody and like they were saying like, what would you do if you went back in time? And somebody's like, oh, I, I would bring an iPhone and I would show all the medieval people and stuff like that. And then I told them like, well, yeah, that'd be cool to show them. But then they're going to ask you how it works. Yeah. It, yeah. And he's, just, he's like, yeah, I didn't think that far ahead. I, I would not be prepared for that question. Yeah. Good luck. You know. What would you do if you went back in time? What would you want to, what's the one thing you'd want to experience? Oh man, I would make a bunch of bets. Yeah. I, could, I would like learn my history and they're like, uh, I, I know when King Alexander is going to die, I'll bet you 50 chickens or whatever. And I, I'd just be the richest person of all time off of just gambling. Basically. And you'd have a, uh, you have a great farm going. Yeah. I mean, back then that's really all you had going yeah. for you. Livestock. Yeah, basically. What would you do if you went back in time? Oh, man. It's a, uh, it's a great question. Um, and you can go back to any time period. Heck, you can even go back last week. Any time period? Man, I might go back to the, uh, the, uh, the turn of the century in order to drive one of those uh, old uh, kind of like hybrid cars with the huge motors in them. Yeah, one the of old Henry controls. Fords. Yeah, man. Just looked like a, like a steel block on a wooden wagon. Just goes about two miles an hour. <laughs> and I just see how long it took me to uh, to drive from like where I was at to the next big town over, and then getting a perspective on that. I wonder what the first wreck was like. It couldn't have been. But, but everyone was kind of all right, you know. Yeah, it was just like they, they might have like. I don't even know if they could have sustained any injuries. Yeah. They have much worse on a regular basis, like, you know, shoveling coal or, you know, hoeing rows or. Yeah. You, back in the day, you get more hurt from a slap than you would being in a car wreck. Yeah. Cars just didn't go fast enough and, uh, you know, less concrete, more, more weeds. Yeah. Basically. You can throw in the grass. Imagine like, getting henry ford back then the early 1900s and bringing him to today's world and showing him like a tesla or something yeah. like that wow it's crazy how far vehicles have came and less well a little over 100 years i guess i don't know when the first vehicle was yeah or i just go to like paris and take like ten dollars and eat like a king for like a week because you could do that you know, just have yeah. like, you know, if you had $10, the world was your oyster for, for a while. You could buy so all the oysters you wanted. Yeah, you could. You could stretch that $10 bill. In some countries, you can still do that. I think it's like Thailand or something like that. You can go there with like a hundred bucks and you're a millionaire or something. Yeah, I've had, uh, I've had acquaintances who like took, a took like a month to just go out to Thailand and uh, quote unquote, find themselves out there. You know, that's what you, you do in Thailand. You go out there, you go out there and really just find yourself. But uh, yeah, apparently it's it's uh, not too expensive and uh, an awesome time. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful city. 
And if you go to the capital city, then you just get to say Bangkok all the time. And, and that's pretty funny to say. Man, there's some, yeah, there's some crazy places, especially more rural states like, you know, Arkansas. There's like a, we got like a possum grape, Arkansas. We got like a toad suck, Arkansas. Yeah. My, my yeah. dad's been to toad suck. Oh, yeah. yeah he, he, uh, he liked it out there. And, and he only went because of the name. That is the sole reason that he went out there. Yeah, I don't know what they do out there. It's a, uh, I don't know, man. I don't know what you do in Toad Suck. I was never allowed to go. I think there's like there's a hell somewhere. Like you can actually go to hell. It's awesome. I forget where that's at. Somebody can Google it out there. And, and if you need a road trip idea, then you can literally go to hell. Just tell your friends to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> man, life is a weird thing. Yeah, man. How big is your uh, studio there? Or your, uh... It is pretty, pretty good size. It's a little bit bigger than my first apartment that I paid way too much money for. I wish I could give you a wide shot, man. It's, I, I've done a lot of work in here. I, like I said, yeah. I, got, I got Jimmy Page right there. I got Jim awesome. Morrison. And if you look really closely, you can see Jim Morrison's nipple for some oh. reason. Yeah, the, 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 the nipple shows right there. He's free in the you. nipple. But over there on that wall, I've got like a huge record wall. If, if you go back and watch any of the podcasts, you, you can see a little bit of it when we got people here in the studio. But I've always won a record wall. My wife would never let me do it. And somehow I talked my boss into doing it. So <laughs> record wall. It looks awesome. All originals, too. I got, a, I got uh, this picture of Bill Monroe up here on my wall. I don't know if you can see it or not. Yeah, man. Is that a drawing or is that a legit yeah. picture? It's a, it's a drawing. So, um, I got a cord in my thumb. They had a, an estate sale, like in Hendersonville, I guess, where Bill Monroe's old house used to be. And they're selling off a bunch of memorabilia. My brother went, got that along with some other stuff. Oh, so that came and, from like his legit house? Uh, yeah, or his son's house. Whoa. Uh, yeah, James Monroe. But, uh, it's pretty cool, man. And I think I, I, I'm about out of hats now. I think I have one more hat. But I got like some Bill Monroe hats and, uh, a lovely uh, stylish plate and a nice tie with Bill Monroe on it. You Wait, know. do you got like actual like hats that like that he wore or just like hats, no, that, no, like no. hats that he wore? It was like, I guess it was like some of his old road merch that hadn't sold and they were just clearing it out. And so it's wow. like some of his old maybe hats that he would have sold at his table. Pretty cool, man. But I'm glad that there's still bands like y'all that are keeping that you know, traditional bluegrass sound alive. And, and it seems like here lately, man, I don't know what has caused it, but there's been like a revamping of the bluegrass sound. I guess it's Billy Strings, but even then, like before him, I, I was yeah. hearing a lot more bluegrass bands coming up around the area. So I don't know exactly what started this whole, you know, revival of bluegrass sound. Yeah, I don't really know either. I mean, Billy has done so much, you know, like he's, he's brought in a whole new audience to bluegrass that probably would have never found their way in if it wasn't for him. But, you know, other guys, even like Del McCurry has done that. Like he's got this interesting following of like, <laughs> he's got this interesting following of like, you know, diehard traditional bluegrass fans, but also he can like pull in fans from the fish world and like the dead world. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is about those guys. They're just, you know, they got that magic, you know. Dell's Dell seems like one of those guys that everyone would like to know, you know. I, I think it's that way with, like, almost all br bluegrass players. Like, you just – they they just automatically seem like nice, down-to-earth people it, because it's such a – like, you know, like a kind of a happy music form. Like, I can – I, I know that there's sad bluegrass songs, but even then they still kind of make you feel good. But like oh, yeah. you, you have to tap your foot, you know, you have to do like some type of groove to it. It's almost like booty music, like booty acoustic music. I don't know. Yeah, dude. It's a, uh, it's, it's a, uh, the old, I don't, I don't know what you call it. It's like got punk elements and then it's got like, you know, the blues element and it's the, uh, it's the country boy blues, basically. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, I don't know. It makes you, yeah, it makes you want to shake that thing a little bit. 
Yeah, man. Acoustic booty music. Yeah, it's got that booty hop in it. And, and it's it's almost prop I don't know like what the oldest art form of music would really be, but like that has to be up there. I, I yeah. guess because like originated from folk or I don't really know the history of bluegrass. That would be an interesting Google. Yeah, it's like playing the rocks and then human voice and then like move on down the line a little bit. Someone put a string on something and not too much later there's bluegrass. You know? Yeah. It's just a couple things removed from beating a rock together. Basically. And and, yeah. I, and I love like just how it's mostly acoustic instruments. And it almost like it feels like that's the most natural form of music that there is. There's no electricity. If you're good enough you know, craftsmanship when it comes to wood and metal and stuff like that. You can make your own instruments. It's, I, I don't know, man. Like it, it comes from the earth, it feels like. It's yeah, like, it, it's got a primal thing, you know. The people who it comes from are like, who who originated the music, talking about like Bill Monroe and the Stanley Brothers, specifically those guys. I mean, even Le Lester Flat and Earl Scruggs were all like from very – rural places and we're just kind of like working with what they had you know they had banjos around they had mandolins around and uh you know they I don't even know what all they were listening to I feel like Bill Monroe wasn't listening to much but uh like blues and then fiddle you know yeah like it was this blues cat named uh I can't think of his name right Arnold Schultz who Monroe was really inspired by and also his uncle Penn uh, who's a fiddle player and that's like the musical inspiration he had and then he just took what he heard and kind of had a mandolin and like created this new art form that's very you know it was very new and modern for the time but also it had a very primal edge to it yeah it's nothing like it man man that is a crazy thought that the first person to like start making music whatever it sounded like they had no inspiration. Yeah. It just came out of nowhere. Yeah, you're just having to dig from, like, the elements surrounding you in your life situation and just, like, I don't know. It was based off so much less than uh, than what we have to base music off now. Like, I hear, I'll, I'll hear music, and it's so, uh, I just feel like I, I'll hear music, and great music, too, but, like, you'll hear so much of so many different, artists elements in music you know you could turn on the radio station and hear some singer and you'll hear you know hip-hop elements and uh, country elements and like rock and roll elements jazz elements all mixed with like you know within this one song music like old time music and old country and old bluegrass and old blues it's like those people were just drawing from uh seems like more pure emotion than just actual musical influence yeah if that makes any sense so if you listen to those old recordings like old field recordings of you know mountain music from like the you know north carolina virginia eastern kentucky area mm -hmm. or like old blues from the delta it's almost got this uh uh it's a, it's a good way to put it I don't know. Primal is like my favorite way I've ever heard it described because it makes so much sense to me. It doesn't sound, uh, it sounds old and not just because the recording quality is old. It just sounds like the way that music was passed down for hundreds of years before, uh, before it all started getting captured, you know? And, yeah. I, I like the word primal that fits it because like sometimes, yeah. uh, just, just to get away, I'll go rent a cabin somewhere and you know, like, like I'll, eat nothing but natural stuff, try to like reset my body and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, the thought occurs that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. That This is how life is supposed to be. It's almost like my mind and my body tells me like, this is it. This is what you were born, the human body, the, the humans in general, this is the way that they were born to live. But society comes around and just messes that up. And that's the same feeling that I get whenever I listen to bluegrass is like this is how real music 
is supposed to sound almost. I still love hip hop. I still love yeah. jazz and rock and, and, and all that. But there's Me just, too. I love the, I love primal. That is a great way to explain it because your body's just like saying, I guess it's almost in our DNA, especially if you're from the mountains. I guess it's just old DNA genetic genes saying like, this is what your great, great, great grandpa was listening to. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear like those guys, uh, the Stanley brothers specifically, like I remember hearing them on a radio station when I was real young and uh, just, the, I hadn't really listened to a lot of bluegrass at the time, but just hearing them reminded me of like, you know, my mom's side of the family, just the way they sang sounded like the way that my mom's side of the family talked, you know, from rural Arkansas and their people came from Alabama and Kentucky, you know, and it's just, uh, there was like an ancestral connection when I first heard the really old bluegrass. It was like, these people sound like they, uh, like they just got out of a field, like digging taters kind of, or just like shooting a horse or, you know, building a cabin. Yeah. And it's cause the, they, they had, you know, that's what they'd been doing. That's what their music sounded like. You know, their music really sounded like, uh, it was a good, it was a good representation of what their life was probably like, you know, yeah. you could hear it in the music. And back then, like, that's all you really had to do. I, I guess they may, maybe had a football to throw around, but you didn't have YouTube. You didn't have PlayStation or anything like that. If you were lucky enough to be passed down a guitar from your dad or grandpa, I mean, what else did you have to do after yeah, all the work on the farm was done? Exactly. That's like all you'd have time for. Because, you know, man, the generation of people from, like, the early 1900s to, like, you know, mid uh you know 1960s like there's just this you know these old rural farmers you know you're probably related to some of them out there in eastern kentucky that's what all my family was you know uh, my dad's side of the family was all from like east texas uh and south arkansas and it's just like man all anyone did down there was was work yeah like all the time like just busting their backs to to get by you know going through the great depression and all that stuff and their kids you know that's why people had kids was to help them on the farm you know there would be huge like rural farm families and you just had a bunch of kids because you had to have them to to like help you get by yeah it, it, it was crazy like I, I was uh, helping my dad with uh, our family tree i've always wanted to do that and i'm so glad i'm finally getting a chance to do that but uh, we're, we're going through our family tree. And like nowadays, it's easy because like we just, my brother has two kids. Our other cousin maybe has two or three. But now we're getting to like the grandparents and the great grandparents. And it's, it's 15 kids. And they had 10, 11 kids. And dude, it is a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it's crazy. Um, I remember growing up meeting you know, certain families uh, who would have like 10 or 11 kids. Have you ever known any families who have like a bunch of kids? A lot of times it'll be like a homeschool family or like Mennonite family or something like that. Have, yeah. You know, a boatload of kids. It's always interesting to see the dynamic of a family that has like 10 to 12 kids. You know, it's, it's probably a lot different than me, you know, growing up in a household. There's like four of us. And, and, and it's funny too that like, how close they still are you would think that a, a big family uh you know some of them come and go and pass but i was watching an amish documentary a few weeks ago and man the, the bond that those families have i, I guess because you're working with each other every day you're depending on each other to survive that's a yeah. bond that a lot of families will never really get yeah yeah it's uh it's always interesting to me when people don't really get along with their siblings you know is uh, I was a uh, I was homeschooled along with my siblings, and it's kind of, it's like those are my classmates, <laughs> you know, yeah. those are the people I spent every day with. I have a pretty strong bond with my siblings. Do you have siblings? Yeah, yeah, I've got a brother, and he actually is homeschooling his children. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, they're about to graduate right now, and it's the same thing, man. There's a special type, like they, me and my brother are still close, but his kids are way closer than we will ever be. Yeah. But, I mean, you're around each other every day. That's all really time. all you know. Yeah, you got to learn to get along, too. It's like it won't, you don't have a good time if you don't have good sibling, sibling chemistry, you know? Yeah. It, 
Yeah, it's 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 a it's a special bond, man. But I wanted to ask y'all about y'all's band a little bit because like I've always mm-hmm. loved y'all's name. I've I've been listening to y'all for uh, about a year and a half now. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I've loved y'all's music, man. It's awesome to get to talk with you. But the Wooks, where does that name come from, man? I love that name. So we've all been uh been asked this question a good bit. And uh it's uh you know, the wook, there's a lot of different terms for wook, but one term in my mind is is a spun out hippie, like the most spun out of the most spun out hippies, you know. Yeah. You go to the festival and he's the dude that's uh he's not got no shoes on, he's got a skin that looks just like one big scab, you know. Probably dreadlocks. Dreads, missing yeah. some teeth. Uh trying to be someone's bro. <laughs> you having a hard time. But uh we all just say that we are reformed wooks. And that's uh that's what we did in our past lives. Mm. So uh, you know, now we've kinda we've all gotten haircuts and washed the dirt uh out of uh out of where it shouldn't be. And uh yeah, that's so we are all just reformed looks. So instead of being the reformed looks, maybe we should just be the reformed looks. I take it in there. Yeah, it That'd might be a good be a album name. It would reformed. That that is a good name. That'd be a great album name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say you don't really look too wookish. I've never seen a wook with a polo before. You're you're the yeah. First. Oh man, I'm I'm not quite cutting a polo today, but uh, but yeah, you know, I uh, I um. It's, it's it's good to look presentable sometimes uh you know you don't want to get pulled over and get profiled yeah if, if you look wookish and you get pulled over you're getting searched you're definitely yeah. getting searched yeah. hands on the hands on the hood yeah I, I get a little bit wookish every now and then like, like if i go on a camping trip for a week or something yeah. like that by day four man I, i'm i'm a i'm a river rat dude I, i'm a wook yeah, you just kind of start simmering in it, you know. Start, you know, basting, getting that wood based going on. Yeah, them, them primal instincts kicking back yeah. in. Yeah, they start seeping out. You just, before you know it, you're uh, you're stewing in in your own wood. Hey, I like that. So, so uh, how long have y'all been a band for now, man? The band's been together since like 2014, nice. and uh, yeah, so. The original band was uh was all fellas from Lexington, and uh, they started out by uh well this guy Arthur Hancock, who uh, was one of the co-founders of the band along with C.J. Kane, Roddy Puckett, Galen Green, and Jesse Wells. Uh, they uh, C.J. and Arthur started out by um by doing uh like. Tuesday night sets together as the Wook brothers uh, at this barbecue joint called uh, Willie's. Uh, what was the name? Willie's locally known barbecue. Yeah. It's a great name. Yeah. And so they would do solo shows or duo shows rather. And a uh, little by little, they built the band up and uh, they actually ended up putting an album together and going out to Rocky grass in a, uh, in Lyons, Colorado, and went in the band contest out there. And I think 2015, I think was the year. And uh, from there, the band just kind of, kind of took off. And as it's gone on, you know, some people have left and we've added new members back. So now it's uh, I'm playing mandolin. C.J. Kane is the original member. He's playing guitar. Alan Cook, he's from Colorado. He's playing dobro. Got him George Guthrie. He's playing banjo. And uh, as of you know, late we've kind of had a had a different cast of special guest bass players. Cool, so, man. Yeah, George Guthrie, great name. Yeah, Love great a name. name like that. Yeah, it is. He's he's got a name that uh, he's living up to well. So, so what made y'all kind of go the bluegrass route, man? I I know here in the mountains, that's that's a pretty popular way for bands to go, but uh. You know, like I wouldn't think that people in Colorado and Arkansas would be into the bluegrass sound. Huh. Well, um, I mean, I grew up playing at festivals. You know, Arkansas had a little bit of a bluegrass scene. Had more of one in like the 
seventies through the nineties. Um, a lot of little festivals out there, you know, the Ozarks, there's a bunch of festivals. Um, Colorado also has a great bluegrass scene. Um, you know, with Rocky Grass and Telluride, and even Boulder, you know, bands like Hot Rise came out of Boulder. Um, and some of the guys from the infamous Stream Dusters live out there now. So there's always kind of been bluegrass out in Colorado. And in Arkansas, too, it's just been different because Arkansas is kind of more of a traditional uh, bluegrass state. I think of it that way, like everyone's listening to the first generation stuff as far as the guys I grew up around. You know, in Colorado, the people who built the scene were kind of like Sam Bush, Hot Rise, you know, people like Mike Marshall and, uh, you know, kind of more modern bluegrass at the time, new grass revival and Bela Fleck. And so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of that in Colorado that I've seen. It's really cool. And they, uh, they're very accepting of the new or the, uh, the older, more original stuff too, more so than some States like, you know, it's been hard in certain states up until recently. It's gotten better. But, you know, back in the day, if you're playing a festival in like Kentucky or Arkansas, you'd want to keep it pretty straight and traditional and respectful of the of yeah. the, the roots, you know. But but now with people like, uh, you know, you had uh, you know, Sam Bush and Bela Fleck, and then you had people come along like um, the infamous String Dusters and uh, – Yonder Mountain String Band, you know, they kind of brought a whole new group of uh, followers into bluegrass. Billy Strings has done it. So now it's a little more acceptable to uh, to kind of modernize bluegrass. People are, are a lot more accepting about it. And it's such a young music that it's, you know, it's got a lot of, uh, lot of room to experiment in. But I grew up playing traditional bluegrass, man. You know, like listening to Bill Monroe and like Ricky Skaggs or, uh, you know, the most modern stuff I was into as a kid was probably Allison Krauss and the Union Station. Yeah. Um, yeah I love it, Allison. That's good music right there. It's awesome music. And the same with CJ. He grew up like around J.D. Crow in the New South and some of the, you know, some of the band members from that band, which there was always like an epic cast of Kentucky pickers in JD's band through the years in the new South. So CJ kind of came up around that scene and I knew about CJ from, uh, from like going to festivals in like, there's a town called Mountain View, Arkansas, uh, that I used to go to a bluegrass festival at. They had two a year, one in the fall and one in the spring. And I remember seeing uh, CJ play down there with a lady named Katie Penn and her band, Newtown. And I just kind of known of him for a while. And, uh, but when I met him, it was kind of cool because he was into some of the same like Southern rock music that I was, you know, like he's really into the band. He's really into Leonard Skinner, you know, and, uh, and Arthur Hancock was really into like a lot of songwriters, like, uh, he really turned me on to like Robert O'Keen or, uh, Towns Van Zandt, yeah, you know, I love Towns, man. Oh my God. Such beautiful music. One of the best yeah. songwriters ever in my opinion. Yeah. So it's like, a you know, we've all kind of had this mutual love for certain bluegrass, especially like Tony Rice, who uh, the the late great Tony Rice. We all kind of have bonded over his music. Everyone in the band is like very inspired by Tony, I'd say, and throughout the band. But also, there's kind of there's a uh, other inspirations that are being drawn on other than just traditional bluegrass. But it is kind of interesting that this band, we most of us in the band. Uh, all have a uh, like a pretty heavy traditional bluegrass background like that's what we came from rather than uh, a lot of people who come to the jam grass scene and bluegrass scene younger folks come from like you know maybe they had a background playing in a fish cover band and heard fish do that song ginseng sullivan the Nor it's a norman blake song and tony rice made it famous and fish you know they heard they heard tony do it i'm pretty sure but a lot of people might hear that song Ginseng Sullivan and go, oh, that's a fish song, and then trace it back to Tony or someone like that and get into bluegrass that way. But we're a band that kind of got into bands like Fish and The Dead and like Tom Petty and, and stuff like that after we had, uh, you know, spent years nerding out on traditional bluegrass. It's like that's kind of what we came from first and then worked our way into it, so... Yeah, I just now uh, recently, like a few weeks ago, heard the term jamgrass. 
Yeah. Uh, to to me, it's just <clears throat> I've been naive, I guess, and just think like, oh, bluegrass, bluegrass, bluegrass. But I just now I did not know that there was a thing called jamgrass, and I love that term now. So yeah. do y'all like wh- which category do you put y'all's self in? I don't know, man. There's some times where we like, you know, we all love that. We all love and some form of jam type music. Yeah. You know, whether it be fish or the almond brothers or, uh, you know, even like, uh, you know, grateful dead. We've all been inspired by that in some ways. And there's certain songs that we do that we would probably jam more on, but also, uh, songwriting is a big focus in the band. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of songs that we've written that just like you wouldn't want to jam on it. It's like it's a story song, you know. It's about the words that are being sang, and it's not about just you know extending the jam, which is awesome and fun to do on certain stuff. But it's you know, I also like being a band that's able to just like really present a story in a song and capture attention with that, you know, rather than just yeah. like a you know just try to play play out for 30 minutes which is fun you know it's cool yeah. it's fun to get into a jam with your your bandmates play out but it's also nice to like feel confident in delivering a song and like really telling a story i've always appreciated jam bands because you can tell that <clears throat> those guys in the band really enjoy what they're doing you know like they're, they're, they're going for it trying out new things and sometimes like uh, the the fans will end up liking the live version more than the original. Like when it comes to the Grateful Dead, I love their version of Bertha, the live version, way more than the recording. Like yeah. that's what I listen to. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I know what you mean, man. A lot of the times, live stuff is going to be different than than the recorded version. I've gone to see certain bands, you know, and I've listened to their albums before. Uh you know, where you kind of just know the, like the layout of the, uh, <clears throat> of the recorded version, but then you go to see them live and they do something different that you really haven't, you know, that, that wasn't captured on the, uh, you know, the audio, you know, the CD recording, the album version of the song, you know? Yeah. You know, it's, it's always fun to go hear some, something from a band that you like, and then they do it a little different than uh, you know, what you're used to hearing them do. And I think that's why people, have really, you know, so many people that I've met have gotten into like taping shows. I've met dudes who taped hundreds of like Grateful Dead shows and they love them because everyone is different. It's just, uh, you know, it's a really big part of the experience is like knowing the music, but also the surprise of like not knowing where the song is going to go during this particular performance, you know, yeah. like the band might have played a song, you know, like if it was the dead, they might have played, you know, uh, like Scarlet Begonias one way the night before and then you know tonight they're going to do it and it's going to take you somewhere completely different because they don't really know where they're going that's what's awesome about jam like it is it's always going to take you somewhere different like free form jam music it's a different journey every night and when it it comes to jam bands I would say that the Grateful Dead like they're, they're number one right like I mean when it comes to like probably the greatest jam band I, I don't know. I, whenever, whenever you think of jam band, my mind goes directly to those guys. I, I, yeah, it's. I mean, I think I think they might have been one of the first bands that were really like, you know, playing a song and and taking the uh, taking the music as far as they could with it, you know, and just kind of going into uncharted territories with a certain song. And a lot of other bands have picked up on it, you know, and uh, kind of done their interpretation of that. It's, you know, it's great. It's great. But also, you know, there's something awesome about uh, you know, listening to Bob Dylan do uh, you know, that song, Isis. You ever heard that song? Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a big Bob Dylan fan, man. Yeah. So, I mean, there's it's kind of got, like, there's solos throughout it, but it's not like an extended jam song. It's just got a really interesting storyline. and The words are so uh, uh, captivating like you just want to continue with the story you know yeah so i wonder when it comes to the grateful death they were just having a good time or took too much acid i don't know like what happened i think i think think so 
<laughs> Thank God for LSD. They just forgot about the timestamp and just kept on going. Still one of the greatest concerts I've ever been to, though. You went to a, a dead concert? My, for my very first time back in 2019, I went and oh, seen them in, uh, I think it was Bristow, Virginia. Dude, there was like 25,000 people. And I've never seen a concert so well behaved, I, I, yeah. I would say. Everybody was so nice. Like, I mean, yeah. Yeah, there were still people, you know, like, ha- having a good time. But everybody was just treating each other so great. Even like the security and the cops were some of the nicest security and cops that I've ever seen at a concert in my life. It was such a beautiful experience. That's awesome. And I think that's a big part of what the, like the dead was built on was just the, uh, the community and the experience at the shows. It was just more, it was even more about them. It was more than just the music, you know, it was a, it was a community thing and kind of like, a family thing. There's so many people who bond over the dead and that can, you know, they can have completely different lives, but you know, they can find the uh, common dead connection and just, you know, then they're like family, they're like old friends. Yeah, man. I, my wife, she, she's a Justin Bieber, Jonas brothers fan. Me and her do not share a lot of music in common whatsoever, but she pointed that out one day because I'll just be somewhere very random in like South Carolina and in, in a state that I don't visit much. And somebody has a grateful dead shirt on and I'm like, Hey dude, nice shirt. And I'll probably be wearing something or he, see, he sees my bumper stickers on my car. He's like, Hey, nice bumper sticker. It's just that instant connection where, you know, like, that's a cool person right yeah now. yeah it is it's cool man and i've seen that in kentucky with people like tyler childers has kind of done that in kentucky man and he's like you know he's a he's a he's like a country singer and songwriter i hate to just call him country man because he's like bluegrass as well he's definitely got a strong bluegrass influence and sound but he's like created a a whole scene of people who you know you'll just see someone out wearing a Tyler Childers shirt and instantly have that connection with them. You know, you're like, Oh, even if you don't really know him, you're like, Hey, I like that guy. Cause we have this connection over this music, you know, it probably means similar things to us. And that's, what's awesome about music, man. Uh, there's a really great scene, music scene in Lexington, Kentucky right now. And, uh, yeah, man, he, he, he's done a lot for that, too. I, I know Chris Stapleton is, like, the, the big one that everybody knows, but I think that Tyler really captured the the Appalachian sound the, the best way. Chris is a phenomenal songwriter and, and a phenomenal hit maker. But when it comes to somebody who captures the culture, captures what the mountains are really like, that's Tyler. And, and especially with his last album, uh, you know, like where he's, it's mostly instrumental and, he, and he's playing the violin. Like, I have family in, you know, middle Georgia who, who aren't big bluegrass fans. And they didn't necessarily get what he was doing with that. But I yeah. was like, he, he's paying homage. He's yeah. not forgetting his roots. This is what his holler sounded like. Yeah, man, it's really interesting. I remember the first time hearing his music. It, uh, it, it took me back to, like, certain places. Like I knew, uh, I knew of growing up and people I knew growing up in just like very rural kind of Southern areas, you know? Yeah. There's no hiding that sound. It's a, uh, he's pretty forthcoming with it, which is awesome. I appreciate that. He's not trying to hide where he's from. And uh, that means a lot to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, man. He, he seems like he's, as real as it gets whenever it comes to his lyrics. And I've seen that y'all, y'all have done some shows together. Y'all look like y'all are, y'all are pretty tight. Man, so him and the, uh, him and CJ, uh, you know, have known each other a long time. And of course, Arthur Hancock, him and Tyler are old acquaintances, musical comrades. Uh, and I guess, you know, they, they were, they were really tight with Tyler before he, you know, became known on such a large stage and uh you know when i first joined the band as just an anthem player um i uh some of my first shows were opening for him and i hadn't i kind of heard of him but i didn't really know who he was but we ended up opening these shows for him at these clubs one of them being like the uh i guess it's the 40 watt in uh in athens georgia mm-hmm. and him packing the place out 
I just remember seeing that and going, whoa, this guy's doing something. And, uh, yeah, I just kind of like – my introduction to him was like when he really first started blowing up. He put, he put out that first record. And, uh, yeah, so him and – I know him and CJ are old buds. They've known each other a while. And, and, and that's cool how, like, he doesn't – forget his friends from back in the day like uh, i'm uh pretty good friends with uh david prince laid back country picker there you go, man. yeah I, I love david man uh, him and Teresa, some of the best people on planet earth Very but cool. it's, it's cool how uh they you know they were his teachers back in high school and they're yeah. phenomenal musicians too but i mean he let him open up for he let him open up for that well him and red rocks yeah and that's such he's such a cool dude the way he does stuff like that yeah that's a cool thing to do man that's a uh that's just like what a real real cat does you know yeah i i think that you know music is like coming back to the roots especially when it comes to the country sound or americana whatever you want to call it uh, you know luke bryan and florida georgia line and, and all that stuff has got this far but i just think after a while man people want to go back to the roots and whenever you hear an artist like tyler childers or listen to music like y'all's or culture wall or or billy strings whoever like we were saying earlier man that those primal instincts kick back in especially if you're a country folk and you're yeah. like this is this is what real music sounds like and, I, and i'm so glad that that you know the the revamping of good country americana folk music is happening again yeah for sure man it's it's great it's good to see you know see it living on especially uh i have such a, a spot in my heart for bluegrass it's always good to see that someone's keeping it going especially when you can tell that someone really has like you know even even as modern bluegrass musicians like there's some that you can tell have just like they've really put in their time and effort to learn like very like the, uh, the core traditional stuff, you know, like Chris Thiele, who's this amazing mandolin player, just amazing musician overall for a So kind of guy is someone who has like, you know, you can tell in some of his playing that he's like, listened to a lot of Bill Monroe and early mandolin players like Frank Wakefield. And uh, so it's cool to hear someone that can play like very modern, you know, progressive music that is also uh, also really studied, you know, the old school cats, you know, the OGs. Yeah. It's cool to hear. So I always appreciate, uh, always appreciate hearing someone keeping, uh, keeping the, uh, the new stuff sound a little bit old. <laughs> that's, that's a good way to sum it up man i have nothing but respect for y'all bluegrass players like uh, now that i've i'm not a big musician myself i mess around a little bit but now that i've like learned chords and and progressions and harmonies and, and all this whenever i watch a band like yours play and i'm watching your fingers and, and i'm listening to the notes that y'all are hitting and how this harmony moves in with this harmony and man it is such a complex art form it's beautiful but damn y'all y'all gotta y'all play some of the most difficult music on earth it seems like yeah it's really uh it's it's a hard music to make perfect and so that's why a lot of the times uh it sounds more honest when it's when it's got the rough edges around it you know it's a very it's a very human made music it's a uh, there's, there's no faking that it was like digitally put together on a computer or you know heavily edited music or auto-tuned or anything when it's uh when you hear music that's recorded and it's like very broke down and raw at its core like bluegrass normally is it's got strong human element to it uh the imperfections is what is kind of what can make it incredible you know dude it, it was awesome to talk with y'all man like i said I've, I've been listening to y'all for a while now every time that i go hiking uh, i can put on one of y'all's albums like glory bound and it just it makes it an incredible hike so i've 
I, I love what y'all are doing, man. And I'm really looking forward to what y'all put out next. Are, are you working on anything right now? Yeah, or what's going out, so we got an album in the can and uh, it'll be released at the uh, beginning of next year, very soon. So uh, looking, uh, looking forward to that, you know, we haven't put out an album in a while and uh, yeah, got an album of all new tunes coming for you. So be looking early part of next year, you know, early, early winter. Good to hear, man. And for everybody that wants to check out y'all's music, go see a show, all that good stuff. Where do they go yeah, to do all that? Wookoutamerica.com or on Instagram at Wookoutamerica or Facebook at The Wooks. Um, yeah, check us out on there. We'll be updating it with where we're going to be and what we're doing, what music we might be putting out, and all that fun stuff. Well, Harry, thanks again, brother, man. And, and yeah. thank y'all for all the great music, dude. I, I love it. Thanks for having me, man. I sure appreciate it.